the poll, how, how hot is it wherever you are today? Um, I think the Northwest folks would win the prize. I wanted to let everybody know that this is being recorded as we, you just heard. And now we can actually welcome people in. Thank you for joining us today. We have about 60 folks on the call. A lot of people from Massachusetts and a bunch of people from outside of Massachusetts. So welcome wherever you are calling from. I wanna thank you for attending. I wanna welcome you back if you attended the first session. And I wanna say thank you very much to Amy Waldman, my colleague, and to the presenters who did uh, a lot of preparation for being part of this. So I wanna say thank you to Becca and to Claire very much for being part of this. We will have a little break that will happen further into the program. So you will have time to go grab a, a glass of water, a cup of coffee or whatever you'd like to do. And I also wanted to recognize that we have many people from many different agencies today, including many of the rape crisis centers in Massachusetts. Sorry, I have to go a little bit slower. Sorry, we have interpreters on the call. So we were are supposed to be speaking in a way that allows the interpreters to interpret. Got ahead of myself. I wanted to talk about the fact that uh, today we'll be talking about the case, ma case management program, the economic case management program that is run by Boston Area Rape Crisis Center. But I also wanna mention that Every program in the state that we have that is a rape crisis program provides case management services. We, we, do, we know that this is true. We know this is required for our, our funding that we have. And that case management really is person to person, whatever that person needs. And we also have some programs that are running some very specific economic uh, schools or economic work with their clients that are sexual assault survivors. I think that what we know out in, in our state is that a lot of the economic work is with really focusing on domestic violence situations. While a lot of sexual assault survivors are also experiencing domestic violence, and sometimes that is, it is within the experience of domestic violence that they are also experiencing sexual assault. We know this, all of us know this who are on the call today. There are so many times when individuals who are, have experienced sexual violence have not experienced that within the context of domestic violence. And uh, so that is really a part of what we also wanna make sure we're bringing to light and we're really highlighting that in the program that we're doing today. So that is my little introduction. And I would also like to welcome and introduce Diana Mancera, who is the Director of Membership and Programs at our coalition here in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Coalition Against Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence. And I will say she comes from a rape crisis center, which is where I knew her originally. And frankly, being her presence at our coalition really helps to raise the profile of the issues, the, all of the issues of sexual violence. So I'm very excited about that part of her work in particular. Um, so I wanna introduce Deanna, who's going to give some welcoming remarks. Thanks, Deanna. Thank you, Janice. And thanks everybody and to the interpreters for- you know, Rebecca, making... this is Amy, how can I help you? Oh. There's someone who's speaking at the same time. Yeah. I think somebody has their microphone on that is having an outside call. Jennifer, can you see? I muted them. Okay. Sorry. Thank you, Jennifer. It's totally fine. We know that, you know, now that we're all in like Zoom lives, we'll um, have to be doing that and at the same time responding to crisis calls, so that's totally fine. Um, so again, thank you so much for having us. And I am just like as delighted as um, Janice shared with you about like sort of my commitment and my passion to sexual assault. I've been doing that for a long time. And, and the core of a lot of the work that I do is really keeping in mind uh, sexual assault survivors. 
So again, my name is Diana Mancera. My pronouns are she and ella, and I am the director of membership and programs at Jane Doe Inc. Jane Doe Inc. is also known as JDI, which is the only sexual assault and domestic violence coalition in Massachusetts. We are made up of uh, about 60 sexual assault and domestic violence member programs. Uh, we believe that a strength and resilience come from our collective work in and with our members, as well as our community partners. We believe that together we can prevent the conditions that make, that make uh, the foster sexual assault and domestic violence and that together we can create and foster a world free of abuse. And we also believe in honoring those who really came before us. By doing that, we're honoring the history of our movement, honoring black and trans women leaders who, um, who really led the sexual assault movement. And um, in doing that, we are really honoring the root of understanding the economic impact of sexual assault and sexual violence and addressing survivors' economic needs while we're honoring our history. Black women have fought for equity before even the suffrages. Black and trans women have taught us that in order to create justice, we must create and design our services by centering the most impacted, the ones who suffer the most, those who always come last or lack access. What you heard during the first session in June 14 and what we're about to hear today is just one example of meaningful and holistic programming could look like in your organizations and in your communities. One of my roles at JDI of many of the things that I do um, is to provide coalition member programs with support and technical assistance around program design, implementation and evaluation. And what I always say to folks is that remember the one size doesn't fit all. Any programming uh, addressing survivors and their economic needs must be influenced not only by their survivorship, but also by their race, their culture, their heritage, the language, their faith, their sexual and gender identity, their beliefs, their access or lack of access. And I truly believe that holistic approach services must also be done by folks who are in those communities, uh, by folks that understand that community and the work in that community. And again, like that kind of work just because it worked in one community doesn't mean that it's going to work in every community. What I always encourage folks that I work with is always focus on the person's wholeness and not just in their uh, sexual experience. So again, thank you so much to all the presenters. Thank you to the Department of Public Health for inviting us. And just again, I encourage all of us to think about our history, what made our history and why we're here today. Thanks. Thank you so much, Diana. Really appreciate your being here and uh, everybody else who's on the call today as well. We're going to move into our presentations with our two presenters. And uh, I don't know if you wanna do another, a, a brief reintroduction of yourselves, Becca Loya from Brandeis University and Claire Namuga, who is from Boston Area Rape Crisis Center. Um, and I'm gonna turn the program over to you. I'll be, by the way, just keeping track of questions in the chat. So if there's anything that you wanna ask, we are going to take time at the end to make sure that we're addressing the questions. If the question is not addressed by the presenter during the course of their discussion, then we'll keep a, keep a little, uh, we'll keep track of that and make sure your question is asked again at the end. So feel free to put anything in the chat that works for you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for having us today. Thank you to um, DPH and thank you so much to Diana from JDI for welcoming us all today. Um, I am, as um, Janice said, I'm Becca Loya. I'm a researcher with um, the Institute for Economic and Racial Equity at Brandeis University. And 
So pleased and honored to be presenting today with Claire Namuga from Boston Area Rape Crisis Center. Um, I am just gonna start by revisiting the learning objectives that we talked about last week as well. Um, but before I do that, I just wanna do also acknowledge and recognize the tremendous wealth of expertise we have with us today. It's so powerful. We'll be allowing more time for questions and discussion at the end of today's session. So I really hope that we get to hear from you um, and learn from you today. Um, so let me get into our learning objectives. So this has been a two-part training. The first part was on June 14th and it was recorded. So if you missed it, no problem. You can always check it out later. But over the, the two parts of this training, participants will understand the broad economic consequences and challenges triggered by sexual violence, identify barriers to economic stability, learn how an in-depth comprehensive economic case management program can address survivors' complex economic needs, and recognize areas of opportunity for policy reform and innovation. Um, so today we're primor primarily focusing on goals three and four. We covered the first two goals in our first session on the 14th. Today, Claire will begin by sharing about BARC's case management program and how it addresses survivors' economic needs, including identifying tools to assess survivors' economic needs um, and identifying tools and resources to meet those. Um, she'll then turn to how her team engages with partners to advocate for survivors' needs across systems. And then our presentation will close with me zooming way out and giving an overview of some national policy issues and identifying areas for reform. So with that, I will turn it over to Claire. Thank you, Becca. Uh, hello, everyone. <clears throat> I apologize, my voice is a little coarse today. Uh, my name is Claire Namoga, like uh, the commission, and I usually have pronouns. And uh, today, uh, and I don't know if there is any new folks today, but I did mention in my um, first uh, presentation that uh, English is my second language. So for some reason, if there's something that I communicate uh, within this session uh, that uh, you know cannot wait until the Q&A, uh, something that you need me to clarify, uh, please feel free uh, to share it in the chat. And I'm hoping uh, somebody can alert me because I, I don't usually check that chat uh, when I'm presenting. So uh, today, uh, this broader goal that I'm gonna present on is uh, pretty much a continuation of uh, the, the goal that we had for session one. And uh, I just wanted to highlight to be clear in relation to what Janice shared earlier, is that uh, we use uh, the general term case management to describe uh, what we call economic case management services at the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center. So uh, what we mean by that is that um, our services are more are uh, dedicated and focused on uh, each client's individualized economic needs, each survivor of sexual violence's uh, individualized economic needs. And we use a more comprehensive approach, uh, which includes working with the survivor of, of sexual violence and following through with them for as long as they are willing and able to work with us or to engage with us. Uh, to fully uh, address or support them to access their economic resources that they need. So uh, the next example that I'm gonna share can uh, give a clear sense of what this may look like in practice. So um, one of the most common uh, systemic barriers that are our, 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 our clients that we work with encounter is uh, immigration. And so in this example that I'm gonna share, uh, I will talk more about how our case management program works creatively to address an undocumented immigrant survivors uh, needs within the existing systems. So uh, this survivor lost her income due to a sexual assault incident by a stranger at work. And uh, her, partner, uh, her partner's income during the pandemic was impacted. 
So he was out of work temporarily. And so the family, like I mentioned, that all of them do not have immigration, legal immigration status. They have limited resources and uh, they also have limited health insurance coverage uh, because of their immigration status. So how our case management program worked with them. Um, so we do in general work creatively with survivors who have uh, unique barriers like this uh, in different ways. Sometimes this is through identifying and connecting them with alternative and available resources that do not have specific restrictions, for instance, immigration. But sometimes our work involves doing more larger systemic advocacy work uh, to improve uh, to improve the bar or to address the barriers that would come in the way for survivors accessing mainstream resources. And so immigration is not a barrier to accessing uh, victim compensation funds, although it limits uh, some claims that ask for certain documentation, like a social security number. So due to these survivors, immigration status, she could not access victim compensation for lost income. However, uh, case management was able to support her to access that same resource, victim compensation, to pay for medical costs that her limited health insurance was not able to fully cover. Uh, case management assisted this client to access the state's rental assistance program, the RAP program funds, uh, which do not have immigration restrictions to pay the rent that she owed as a result of her income loss. Since she does not qualify for the federal SNAP or food stamps benefits program because of her immigration status, case management assisted her to access uh, food resources through local food pantries as well as assisted her to access um, through collaboration with one of our funding partners to access one month's worth of groceries that this partner helped her pay for so she could have access to like uh, you know healthy food choices. Um, since her children were going to public schools, case management was able to inform her of their eligibility for the pandemic SNAP benefits which do not require immigration status as well. And so with this client's partner being the only income earner in this household and with in his income also being temporarily impacted by the pandemic, the family continued to struggle with paying rent in a relatively more affordable housing unit that they had recently relocated to. Uh, they also struggled during the colder winter days to they struggled with paying for heat uh, in their new unit. So uh, case management collaborated with a local community fund to assist this family to pay for one time oil heat since the family does not qualify for the federal fuel assistance program. The same, the same local community agency was also able to help the family to offset up to three months worth of rent that they owed. Uh, the family continuously struggles with paying their full monthly rent, even in the new affordable, relatively affordable housing unit that they recently had moved to and uh, without uh, needing additional support and with a survivor still working consistently on her healing journey through accessing other services. Originally, she was able to work under the table, but uh, like I mentioned, she lost her job uh, due to this actual same sexual assault incident. The family qualifies for the state's rental assistance program and they, they did qualify uh, 12 months later, they were able to qualify for the raft uh, funds again. But the landlord in this new place was threatening to evict them. And uh, so because this happened during the pandemic, uh, there was an eviction moratorium that our case management program was able to 
fully educate them about uh, so that uh, hopefully they are aware that even though they have not been able to pay their rent, they are protected because of the pandemic. Uh, however, even though the family understood uh, their rights under the eviction moratorium protections, they were still concerned because the landlord continued to uh, you know, threaten eviction. She had actually begun filing a court case against them. And uh, so we did begin to apply for the state's rental assistance program for them again. And, uh, but it was taking longer for them to access those funds, yet the landlord continued to threaten them. So uh, case management was able to research and find another local community resource that was able to assist the family in a more timely manner to access another up to three months worth of rental assistance. And also that fund was able to help them pay for court fees for a court case that the landlord was beginning to file against them. So the family is uh, working creatively to save some money and is looking for another affordable housing unit to move to so that they can use some of the money that they are able to save that was offset with these community funding partners assistance that, uh, so that they can use it to pay for something that is even more relatively affordable. Uh, this family is also closely working with different providers on their immigration status, as well as their mental health needs. <clears throat> okay, so um, you are likely uh, more familiar with uh, some of the protections and compensation for survivors. Uh, so the Federal uh, Violence Against Women's Act housing law protections in the Massachusetts state housing law protections, as well as the Massachusetts Victim Compensation Program. Uh, I did include in the handout some more detailed information about all of these resources and systems. So I will not go into the specific details of how each of them works and what each of these systems entails. But for more knowledge about them, I would encourage folks, and I believe we do have some of uh, the uh, people that work within these programs, I would encourage folks to reach out in case you needed to get a, a training on them uh, or to learn more about them. And uh, we at the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center work closely with the victim uh, with the Victim Rights Law Center when it comes to employment law related needs, as well as uh, we work with the housing justice for survivors, for survivors that have specific Massachusetts and federal housing law protections needs. Uh, we also work with the Massachusetts Victim Compensation and Assistance Program uh, through the Attorney General's Office. Uh, whenever we need like victim compensation trainings or refreshers, or in case uh, we have questions around eligibility issues that our clients are experiencing. <clears throat> so in regard to the housing law protections, in your handouts that I was shared earlier, I did include uh, fact sheets with more details about these housing law protections. The most common needs that our case management clients have under the Massachusetts housing law are breaking the lease. So breaking the lease briefly uh, protects survivors from paying a financial penalty for all Massachusetts housing, whether private or public if they did break their lease prematurely for safety reasons related to sexual assault, stalking, uh, dating, or domestic violence. So once a case manager explains the survivor's rights in relation to breaking the lease, uh, the survivor may feel empowered to advocate for themselves with a landlord. Uh, however, in some of the most common situations, if a survivor is not comfortable 
with bringing the issue back to their landlord on their own. A case manager usually intervenes or offers to intervene or to reach out to the landlord directly. Also, we do explain to clients what this may mean in terms of their confidentiality. For instance, they would be able to know, the landlord would be able to know that they are, we are reaching out because the reason they are reaching out has to do with sexual violence. Um, once a client fully understands this, then uh, we do intervene and work directly with the landlords to educate them about these laws and protections and the financial obligations. Um, sometimes uh, whenever we get landlord pushback, uh, we do connect with mostly the housing justice project through the Harvard Legal Services Center. For instance, in situations where the landlord's lawyer uh, you know, it takes over. So here is a case example to back that up. One of the clients that we worked with needed help to get her name off the previous lease for a place that she left four months prior uh, after a sexual assault incident that happened to her by her roommate. And also to end she also needed to end the financial obligations stated in that list terms. So a case manager explained the applicable housing law protections to break her lease and to not incur financial obligations once she breaks it. Uh, we also supported her in notifying her landlord in writing about the intent to break her lease under the protections of the Massachusetts housing law uh, due to the safety concerns that she had. When the landlord pushed back and uh, involved his, his attorney, uh, our case management program worked with the legal services program through the housing justice project. Uh, we also wrote a letter uh, as a qualified third party, uh, verifying the survivor safety concerns and the need for the survivor to break her lease so that she would not continue to be liable for the rent in the previous housing situation. Then our case management program offered and worked with her to access financial resources that the survivor used to pay to offset the double rent that she paid in two housing situations, the new one that she had relocated to and the previous one that she continued to pay rent for, for up to four months. Then uh, the most common need that uh, under the other uh, housing law protections, uh, the most common need that comes up for our clients, uh, the Violence Against Women's Act federal housing law protections is emergency transfer. So uh, briefly, an emergency transfer means that as a person that is living in federally funded housing can move to a different unit in another area managed by the same company or owned by the same landlord. This would be in situations related to their safety because of uh, abuse. These protections also allow survivors to keep their subsidy even if their lease has not ended um, when they break it. So, our case managers support survivors in these situations to understand their rights. We do write support letters. Uh, we do complete certain forms. For instance, the self certification forms. We also advocate with property managers or landlords to move the process of granting an emergency transfer forward. Uh, a case example for this is when our case manager worked with a survivor who was sexually assaulted by her neighbor in her federally funded elderly or disabled apartment building. She was originally on the transfer list for individuals with disabilities and was told it would take one to two years to get on top of the, and get on top of the waiting list and obtain a new housing unit. Uh, so the client reached out to our case management program to assist with the emergency transfer process due to her safety needs related to sexual assault by her neighbor. 
a case manager explained to her the transfer options and the limitations to them. A case manager also uh, explained to her the uh, certification for the uh, violence, uh, the cell the certification form, and also um, talked to her about how to go about that and asked if she, would, she needed our help with that process. She understood uh, what her rights were and she understood how the process, what the process would look like. She, however, was concerned about how about if I lose uh, my status on the other waiting list that I'm on as uh, somebody with a disability or how about if I move forward with applying for this uh, transfer and I end up getting a unit that is not accessible so with that, uh, our case management program uh, reached out to, the, uh, to this development and uh, explained the client's concerns around if she qualifies for an emergency transfer, uh, can she actually, should, she should be, but can she actually, can the property make sure she gets an accessible unit again? So once we clarified this with her and followed through with her, uh, she moved forward with a decision to apply for an emergency transfer. And uh, with that, uh, the, this particular development was able to move her uh, to uh, uh, an accessible unit within a month, uh, which was much less than the one to two years that she had been previously waiting in, uh, in a unit that she also felt safer in because uh, she was still living with her next door neighbor. All right, I see that I'm supposed to make my, is that more clear? Sorry, I don't keep, I don't pay attention to the chat. So if somebody could communicate with me, I don't know if I missed anything else. And I also wanna make sure people are still following uh, with the way I'm communicating. <clears throat> if somebody can just get off the... Uh... I, I think it's a good pace, Claire. So I think, I think the interpreters, can you give us a thumbs up if that works for you? Yeah, thumbs up from the interpreter. So I think it's a good pace. There were some prob problems with the audio. Is uh -huh. that improved now? I, I kind of put the volume high. I just want to make sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, so another survivor specific system that our case management program often works with is the victim compensation uh, and assistance program through the attorney general's office. Our case managers work with survivors to access both the Massachusetts victim compensation program as well as other out of state uh, programs as it may, it may be applicable to our clients. So the most common expenses that our case management program has assisted our clients with include uh, lost income, uh, medical and mental health expenses. Our case managers assist clients around their victim compensation needs by educating them about the system, how that program works, who is eligible, screening if they do qualify for it, the process to access that program, including the timelines and limitations, as well as the, I would go through the application process with them if they need us to. And then we also follow up in case they needed that help with the victim compensation program uh, to make sure they can smoothly access it. Uh, one of the examples uh, that is different from working with a survivor within Massachusetts victim compensation program is a, a parent of a survivor who is trying, currently trying to access a long-term, uh, paying for long-term sexual assault trauma counseling services for her child uh, who was assaulted outside Massachusetts. Uh, this particular survivor, the younger survivor is working within our clinical services right now. However, our services are short-term and uh, usually our clinicians refer clients out who need long-term uh, clinical uh, sexual assault trauma-focused counseling. Mm -hmm. And so what we are working with this parent on with permission from the survivor uh, is to work with this out-of-state victim compensation program 
to go through the application process. And uh, we are working with the parent to access all the documents that they are asking the survivor to submit to this program and, uh, and so that they can move the process forward. That way, once uh, she's uh, referred out, uh, she is not worried about uh, co-pays or paying for the out-of-pocket expenses for her daughter's uh, you know, trauma-focused counseling. So uh, that is all I had for the most common survivor systems that we work with. So now I'm gonna go into how do we work? How do we assess around clients' needs using our case management intake tool, which is also in your handouts. And um, I'm gonna just walk you through it. Uh, but before I go into the actual tool, uh, I just wanted to mention that most of our work with clients or with survivors is over the phone. And uh, recently due to the pandemic, we've also found ourselves using more email communications with our clients. And uh, we've tried to adopt to a more secure ways of email communications with our clients as well, if they prefer that for privacy reasons. Uh, there are some logistical needs that we always take into consideration, uh, which is like accessibility needs. For instance, uh, does the survivor have language accessibility needs or are there other accommodations that they might need? And also we pay attention to some logistical safety or privacy issues. For instance, what would be the best way to contact them? Is it safe to leave a voicemail? Uh, or is it okay or safe to leave a voicemail with someone else in case we do not get in touch with them? Uh, those are just a couple examples of some logistical issues that we put into consideration before we follow up with our clients. And also, uh, case managers are always mindful and acknowledge that for survivors, reaching out to us takes courage. And uh, we therefore acknowledge and appreciate that, uh, that, that step they've taken in their lives to reach out to us. We also explain to clients why we ask each of the questions that we go through in our intake process and uh, we share with them, uh, we, we share with them why the information they share with us will be helpful to either address their specific needs or to support our program's development. We also do let clients know that if they do not feel comfortable answering certain questions, especially if they need, if the information we're asking for is not relevant to meeting their needs, uh, it's totally okay to choose to not answer any of those questions. So then when you're going to our intake process, uh, I broke it up into different sections the way it actually appears. Uh, so one of the pieces we explain to clients is the scope of our services, uh, which gives survivors a clear understanding and allows them to make an informed decision about whether our services are right for them, as well as to, for them to guide us on how best they would like us to work with them, knowing that they are the best experts in their lives. And if they do fully understand what the scope of our services are, then they can let us know how to move forward with supporting their needs. This approach we realize empowers our clients to feel in control over their lives and their decisions, which sometimes our sexual violence may have taken away from them. So then our case managers explain our confidentiality policy and the exceptions to it. So we do share what our safety planning and, and any interventions connected to that would look like. For instance, if a client discloses to us a safety concern for themselves or for someone else, and if they cannot consent to a safety plan. Sharing this information in advance gives survivors a choice of what they feel okay to share with us. It also helps 
to build a trusting and safer working relationship with them. And then in- Claire, Claire, can I interrupt for one more moment? Can yeah, you speak, uh, speak in your microphone? Some additional people are being uh, challenged. I'm gonna maybe make the volume go to the maximum. I think you probably need to raise raise your voice if you can, Claire. Okay, sorry, my voice. I'm losing my voice a little bit, but I'm gonna try my best. <coughs> <coughs> so, uh, in regard to care coordination assessment, our case managers assess if a client is working with anyone else regarding their case management needs or there are other stability needs. Our case managers explain why care coordination might be important at some point of our work together to better streamline case management services with them. Does that sound more clear, folks? Trying. <clears throat> Am I more clear now? I think so. I we got to thank you. Okay. Um, and other folks are saying that they can hear you. Okay. Thanks, That's Claire. Very, very close. <laughs> okay. Then, in regard to current or anticipated legal issues, our case managers assess around this aspect of our work. If a client is, if a client has or expects to have an ongoing court case so that they can be able to then speak to our legal department about what that might look like in terms of accessing services from us. So uh, for instance, in case their records ever get subpoenaed, what that might look like in terms of how we keep our notes uh, to better support them. So once we explain that to our clients, and if that's their particular situation, and they need to speak with our legal program. It allows them to make an informed decision about, about how to move forward with working with us. <clears throat> so, and then uh, we ask about self-identified demographic information. Our case managers inform our clients about the option to share this information, more for supporting their individualized needs in the most accessible way. However, sometimes we do ask for this information for more program development purposes. For instance, for funding or policy advocacy work, if that information would be necessary to share in the form of data in the future. It is important to note that there is some demographic information that case managers do not keep in case it might hurt a client. However, there is some information that we keep so that we can provide uh, you know, the most uh, holistic support to our clients or most accessible support to our clients. Uh, for instance, our case managers do not record uh, a survivor's immigration status if a client is undocumented in case their records ever get subpoenaed and that may be used against them, their immigration status may be used against them. And then we, we do record if a client has a disability, certain disability, for instance, if they will require certain accommodations that will help us to guide us on uh, making an individualized plan on how to make our services accessible to them. <clears throat> So then uh, we do explain to clients that uh, some of the information about the incident that they do share with us may be necessary for our case managers to identify more timely resources and services that may support their needs. For instance, in case they may need to get medical care and an evidence collection kit if the incident occurred within five days or sometimes to meet the statute of limitations for victim compensation, except in some unique situations to identify who else to collaborate with. For instance, uh, 
if the incident happened in the context of uh, domestic violence or if they have ongoing domestic violence needs, that this may be necessary for us to work in collaboration with a domestic violence provider to more meaningfully and realistically address their needs. Then case managers uh, intentionally ask uh, for incident information if it is going to be helpful to directly address a specific case management need. So uh, in terms of safety, for the safety planning section of our case management intake, we do assess around uh, the safety needs to determine if there is any safety planning measures that we need to take, uh, which could be like uh, determining if there is a survivor specific housing law rights and protections that the survivor may not be familiar with that we could help them to understand and access. Also to determine what options to navigate depending on the circumstances around their housing stability or safety situation, as well as the type of housing that they live in. Um, then under the financial status section, our case managers assist around this, for instance, to determine if the client is eligible for victim compensation or if they are not eligible for victim compensation, what other collaborations like our medical or funding providers we may need to bring on board or we may need to reach out to to assist a client who may not qualify for victim compensation. Uh, this is also to navigate, if I, in this section it's also helpful uh, to navigate if clients need assistance with employment uh, or if they have like job search needs, need help with writing a resume or cover letter, uh, preparing for a job interview, or if they need some kind of funding assistance to pay for a job training program, which uh, is a, a specialty role that one of our bilingual case managers uh, specializes in. And also in this section, it helps us to navigate what benefits a client may be eligible for and ask an offer to assist them in case they are interested in exploring and applying for those benefits and, uh, and working with them throughout the whole process to access the benefits in case they choose to go for that. Uh, we also in this section uh, navigate different options uh, that may not necessarily be benefits uh, because maybe they have some restrictions that make them ineligible for those benefits. So we do explore, you know, if there are food resources they qualify for, uh, if there are affordable housing options that are available to them, but also in general, other benefits that they might be qualifying for to help them address their economic needs. And so the final section of our case management intake tool uh, is the section with the current needs section that pretty much highlights all the common needs that we support our clients to address in case management. We use this section also sometimes uh, to share at the beginning of our intake some of the examples. For, so for instance, for somebody that may reach out to us and is just interested in understanding what do you do for survivors? What needs do you, what do you, what needs do you address? We also use some examples from this section to explain to clients what our services entail, um, other introduction, other intake. And then uh, if survivors understand what our needs, case management addresses, uh, they are able to then sometimes articulate or share what they would need help with. And that also helps us on our end to come up with a service plan, uh, which sometimes on our end may include in doing some research on our end and uh, to make sure we consult with other providers sometimes uh, to make sure we can then support a client to access the resource they need to, uh, to address the needs that they were able to identify. Uh, 
we also in this section explain to clients uh, what we could do to fully support them around their economic needs so they are fully aware of the scope and limitations of our services. So that is pretty much our case management in tip two. And now I'm gonna share uh, an example of a affordable housing search process, which also has its own intake process. Uh, in your handouts, I shared a copy of a housing guide. Uh, our case management program developed this tool to make the language more accessible for survivors to fully understand how the complex affordable housing system works and how our case management program at BAC can support a client throughout this process to access this system. It allows survivors uh, going through this process of our intake first with this accessible housing guide allows survivors to make a fully informed decision about this part of our services within the affordable housing system. So if a client, after they fully understand how this works and how, what our services would look like, and you know they want to move forward with it, um, then uh, our case managers assist them to complete a housing search intake, which I also included in your packets. With the information that clients provide to us in the housing search intake, the housing specialist then creates an individualized housing search plan that a client's case manager can then use to assist the client with their long-term housing search needs. This kind of assistance that a case manager assists the client with can include uh, completing housing applications, uh, mostly to go on waiting lists, uh, advocating for them to access priorities that they qualify for, uh, writing support letters, collaborating with other providers to back up their applications, including their housing, their housing priority, addressing uh, Corey issues and addressing credit issues in many other ways and needs. So um, I am gonna go to the collaboration part of our work. And so Becca, could we go to the collaboration part? Is this not the right one? It says CM collaboration work. I'm not seeing it. Maybe mine is frozen, but okay. I, I think it's the right one. Okay. So uh, for collaboration work, uh, one of the key parts of our case management role is collaboration. Our clients, we realize, achieve more realistic and meaningful outcomes when we partner with them alongside other providers to address their economic needs. Uh, for, assess, for the assessment, assessment part during our initial intake, it is always a good practice for case managers to, add, to identify if a client is already working with someone else around their case management needs or any other needs that may impact their access to case management services. For instance, if they are working with a mental health provider another case manager, a housing advocate. Uh, this is helpful to better streamline services as well as to understand who else to work with to more meaningfully address a client's needs. And then case managers do consult with providers who are working with a survivor that has specific economic needs to determine if our services would be a right fit for them before they encourage the survivor to reach out to us on their own. Sometimes uh, if a, a client has a close relationship with a provider, our case managers guide a provider 
on how to support that client around their economic needs, uh, especially by sharing some resources that a, a provider may not be familiar with with them, uh, guiding them through the process of how to access those resources. And then a provider would feel uh, comfortable and more knowledgeable to work with that survivor on their own. Case manager has also provided consultation with one rape crisis center uh, that was in, it, in the initial stages of starting a rape crisis case management program. And uh, as well as case management works closely with policy advocacy and training organizations to improve policies and practices that are tailored towards uh, sexual violence survivors housing rights and protections. And then in regard to legislative advocacy work, case management collaborates with organizations that lead policy campaigns to address housing, homelessness, and poverty issues that impact the survivors that our case management program works with. And uh, finally, for collaborations, case management, uh, we do coordinate with different types of providers to address specific client economic needs, as I will show you in the example in the next slide. <clears throat> Thanks, Beck. So uh, over the course of this fiscal year, starting July 1st of 2020 to date, we have relied heavily on community collaborations Case management has connected with at least 90 different community partners to address uh, these broader types of case management related needs in the chart uh, that you're seeing. And we've uh, collaborated with these different uh, providers in at least over 500 sessions uh, with over 100 clients this fiscal year alone. Uh, most of our collaboration has been particularly with community partners to address housing stability needs. So I'm going to speak briefly to these broader types of collaborations and some general reasons why we collaborate with them. So we do collaborate with housing agencies to assist clients to access affordable housing temporary shelter space, housing rights and housing priorities, negotiating rental payment plans with landlords as some examples. Our case management program also collaborates with intimate partner violence or domestic violence providers. When clients have experienced domestic violence and if they are longer term or substantially bigger economic needs can be better addressed by a combination of support from both rep crisis center case management services, as well as domestic violence program services. And also if survivors would benefit from long-term domestic violence focused support services, in those cases we do collaborate with domestic violence providers. And then case managers collaborate with moving of furniture assistance resources. For example, when a client is moving into a new place or when a client needs to replace their furniture that was damaged or triggers them due to a sexual assault incident that uh, is causing them trauma uh, or, that pre or furniture that just presents a health and safety issue to them in general. We also work with health care providers, including health insurance companies, medical and social service providers, for instance, to assist clients with applying for health insurance, figuring out what coverage options exist for them and where someone can get services after they have been approved for health insurance. We also work with mental health providers, such as psychiatrists 
for counselors to navigate how best to work with or communicate with a survivor whose mental health needs are impacting their ability to meaningfully engage in services. Also, we collaborate with mental health providers to back up clients' applications for resources and for protections that they need to access. Case managers also work with mental health providers to assist clients to navigate and apply for longer term supportive mental health and wraparound services that are necessary for their stability. For instance, we work with the Department of Mental Health. So I'm gonna share an example of what our collaboration uh, looks like. And I can read off of this. <clears throat> Just one second, I gotta just go through it. <clears throat> Bear with me for one second. So uh, in this client situation, uh, this client was uh, sexually assaulted by, by her parent, one of her parents, and the client was on that parent's health insurance plan. And uh, she needed medical care, but did not feel safe using the perpetrator the perpetrator's insurance to cover medical bills. So she needed, she also needed to relocate from uh, the housing situation she was living in for a different reason, uh, mostly because her landlord was selling the building. So with this example, a case manager worked extensively with a client and multiple providers, uh, which uh, were including hospitals, mental health, health insurance, uh, immigration and funding agencies to assist with taking the client off her parents' health insurance plan and to apply for her own insurance. We negotiated around paying for medical expenses retroactively, also to access funds to pay for to pay for any anticipated uh, potential remaining medical costs if the new insurance she got could not fully cover them, as well as to pay for the relocation costs. Our case manager also worked collaboratively with a client's clinician to coordinate communication with a least triggering and trauma-informed approach while dealing with all of these systems. So this collaboration resulted into this client's new insurance, paying for all the medical expenses. Uh, it also included paying for the ambulance fees and the doctor's fees retroactively after she was able to obtain her own insurance. The client is still in the process of finding alternative housing and our case management program plans to assist her with any necessary relocation costs. Uh, that is all I had for you from my part. And I believe we are gonna take a five minute break and then we are gonna come back into uh, the second part with Becca. Thank you very much, Claire. I learn a lot when I go through these slides with you. I would like to ask people that uh, as you are going on your break time, would you think about this question? At the last session, Becca talked about some broad economic consequences of sexual violence, such as, and you have talked about them today as well, such as missing work time, losing a job altogether, the costs of therapy and loss of housing. Becca also mentioned the term cascading effects and additional economic consequences for survivors who are marginalized in other ways. So we're gonna ask for a little, a little chat conversation here. 
in the chat, could you, if you would like, name a cascading effect of sexual violence, maybe something that you have experienced with a survivor in the work that you are doing. If that ex is experienced, is more likely to be experienced by a specific population, you could write that too in your example that you put in the chat. Here's a, an example, a person who uses a wheelchair on a day-to-day -day basis may be at higher risk for osteoporosis, for, for weak bones. That would increase the person's chance of getting a pelvic fracture if they're sexually assaulted, which they may not even know has happened if they have um, no sensation in that area of their body. That could lead to immediate and long-term medical costs and possibly lifelong decrease in mobility, increase in mortality, and an increased need for personal care assistance, all of which are economic as well as bodily outcomes. But focusing just on the economic outcomes, could you think about a cascading effect for somebody who has been sexually assaulted that relates to the violence. And we'll take a five minute break and we will come back and um, take a look of what's in the chat. Thanks everybody. You're all set. Go right ahead. Okay, great. All right, so today Claire has provided really valuable information on the tools and the methods that her team uses to serve survivors and to understand and meet their economic needs in practice. Um, now I'm going to take a step way back um, and take a look at some policies that touch survivors in every state. I know we have people joining us from all over the U.S., so hopefully this will be relevant as we think really big picture. So we are, we are, we are zooming way out. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> public policies can help us address the economic needs of survivors in the four main areas that we discussed last session. Those were medical, education, employment, housing, and plus, I will add service provision and service access as well today. So for each of these areas, I'm going to briefly present just a few gaps in current policy and make some recommendations. I want to say off the bat that there are many areas for improvement in policy, and I'm just going to scratch the surface today, focusing on big policies that have a lot of potential and have major gaps. So starting with <clears throat> medical expenses, we'll begin with a really important policy, and it's one that Claire has already mentioned today, and that is victim compensation, um, which, as Claire mentioned, covers expenses related to crime victimization, including medical expenses and other kinds of expenses as well. This is an essential policy because it materially recognizes the economic costs that survivors bear and seeks to minimize, minimize those burdens. Um, and in doing so, it also has sort of what I think of as a symbolic value, meaning it's one of few policies that you know, step in and overtly recognize that um, these types of traumatic crimes come with economic costs that need to be addressed. However, this policy, like most policies, does have some limitations and barriers to access. Um, so first, in some states and localities, when a survivor goes to the emergency room, the hospital will send medical bills to the survivor, and then it is incumbent upon them to apply for victim compensation. They, of course, may not be aware of the policy, or may find it onerous to apply for a variety of reasons, including time, trauma, language barriers, et cetera. Um, victim compensation is also dispensed through the criminal justice system. So most states require a police report to access full victim compensation benefits. Unfortunately, because the reporting rate for sexual violence is so low, this actually leaves out a majority of survivors by default. 
Um, I do want to note that in Massachusetts and in some other states, um, but I'm going to highlight the Massa Massachusetts policy, an evidence collection kit is accepted in lieu of a police report to cover the forensic exam and the emergency room visit, plus up to $25,000 for additional needs. Um, and that they you know, automatically send emergency room bills directly to victim compensation. Some other states also have similar laws, particularly around covering the costs of the evidence collection kit and the ER visit. So in my read of um, state policies, I think Massachusetts is ahead by giving access to the additional um, financial support, accepting the rape crisis, sorry, excuse me, <laughs> accepting the evidence collection kit in lieu of a police report for those $25,000 of additional expenses. Um, in addition, um, in most states, victim compensation covers expenses after they've been incurred. So needless to say, low income and impoverished survivors cannot afford to pay up front and await reimbursement. So the good news is that several states, at least 18 by my last count, plus the um, District of Columbia, have implemented emergency funds to address this need. Those emergency funds um, provide financial support upfront for those who would suffer an undue financial hardship without the award. But, you know, the, the gap here is that the majority of states still don't have those in place. So when we look at policy recommendations around medical costs, um, again, focusing in on victim compensation here, um, I see a need to get some federal guidelines that mandates that hospital bills um, go directly to victim compensation or to the appropriate state agency directly and that they don't come to survivors. Um, and I'm suggesting guidance so that all states can become uniform on this front. Um, but that step still leaves medical bills that are not related to evidence collection. So the next step is about expanding access to victim compensation. Um, so one first step, I would like to see that forensic exam accepted in lieu of a police report for all expenses in all states. That is not a small ask, I recognize that. Um, and then eventually, states might explore the possibility of alternative methods for certifying victimization status, such as through community agencies where survivors seek services. So for example, medical and mental health care providers can be specially trained to collect information and verify survivors' claims and to cooperate with law enforcement if the survivor decides to go forward. Um, I would just note that states have several laws that accept validation of victim status from actors outside of criminal justice or hospitals already, including rape crisis counselors, shelter staff, and clergy. For example, unemployment insurance, which I will talk about later, is, is an example of that. Um, and finally, I would like to see that every state in the country creates an emergency fund to cover urgent expenses so that low income survivors can participate in and benefit from victim compensation fully. Now we will turn to policy opportunities to address the needs of survivors who are students. Um, most people on today's call, I'm sure, are familiar with Title IX of the Education Amendments and its implementing regulations, which prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex in education programs that receive federal funding. Sexual harassment of students, which includes acts of sexual violence, is a form of sex discrimination that's prohibited by Title IX. And this law applies to school districts, colleges, and universities. Um, and federal funding may be withdrawn from institutions that don't voluntarily comply with these requirements. However, despite Title IX policies, survivors are often asked to move residences or to change classes, creating inconvenience and often costs to those survivors. And as I mentioned on our previous session, tuition and fees are generally not refunded to survivors who need to take a time off as a result of sexual violence. So these are some pretty big gaps educationally. 
Now, I, I can't talk about Title IX in 2021 without also acknowledging that, um, as probably most of you are aware, under the Trump administration, administration, Title IX was weakened in terms of the treatment of survivors on campus. Um, for example, allowing the cross-examination of survivors and using the evidentiary standard of clear and convincing rather than preponderance of evidence. Um, President Biden has ordered a review of those rules and the new guidance from the Department of Education from OCR is expected this year. These changes are really important because they affect how many survivors are willing to come forward. And yet <laughs> the limitations that I've just mentioned are ones that predate Trump and that are still in need of attention. So we've kind of got a, an and and problem here with what we need to fix when we look at Title IX. Um, so as far as recommendations, first, as stated, I think we need to strengthen Title IX to at least restore its pre-Trump, pre-Betsy DeVos state. And OCR's comprehensive review will hopefully get us there, although I know there's a lot of discussion going on in policy circles about that right now. Um, secondly, schools need to minimize the burden on survivors um, and immediately address safety needs. So this means not unilaterally moving survivors from classes or housing. In addition, schools should accommodate survivors' needs, including allowing them to retake a course or withdraw without penalty. Um, since the responsibility for tuition paid can constitute a sizable penalty, I do see an opportunity to apply Title IX to have tuition and fees refunded to sexual assault survivors who need to stop out or drop out as a result of violence. Um, however, people who are familiar with the, the dear colleague letter that I cite on this slide will see that these guidelines were almost verbatim included in the guidance under the Obama administration um, for how Title IX should be implemented. And even then, we still had an implementation problem. So a number of the problematic responses to sexual violence were prohibited, and yet they happened anyway. So it was a problem of enforcement and of interpretation of the guidance. Um, so I'm hoping that when the Department of Education releases its new guidance, we might see some steps to improve the enforcement of Title IX as well because it's clear that much work is needed in this area. Um, and I just wanna note that of course, addressing safety needs and accommodating survivors requests can diminish those long-term educational effects by helping them to feel safe and able to engage in academic pursuits. Um, okay, sorry. I Skipped that last bullet, but there it is. Um, all right, now we'll turn to policy gaps around employment. There are many, many employment policies I could talk about, but for brevity today, I'm gonna focus on just two, um, unemployment insurance and the TANF family violence option waivers. So fundamentally, as we discussed last session, when survivors cannot work for reasons related to sexual violence, they need financial assistance. And in my read, unemployment insurance is one path that should be open to survivors who are in this position. Um, I wanna note that most states unemployment insurance does cover intimate partner violence survivors who need to quit their jobs for reasons related to the violence. But 40 states or 41, if we count the District of Columbia, do not cover non-IPV sexual violence survivors. So only the orange ones on this map include non-IPV sexual violence survivors in their unemployment insurance. Um, and the logic that I use here is not highly sophisticated. It's that if we see a need for unemployment insurance to be available, if a survivor is raped by their spouse, um, the same thing should apply if a survivor is raped by their landlord or uh, a colleague at work or an acquaintance or a stranger. Um, the needs are quite similar. Um, the blue states on this map cover um, IPV survivors and in the yellow states benefits may be available under state policy or practice, but they're not required by statute. 
And then the gray states don't, don't include IPV or sexual violence survivors in their unemployment policies. So these data are recent as of January, 2020. Um, and then the other thing I wanna note here is that including survivors in eligibility for the program is only the first step. There are many, many barriers to accessing benefits even when the entitlement does exist. So these barriers are things like onerous requirements to prove victimization status. These also need to be addressed. I think I've taken a first let's expand and get, get access to all the survivors who need it approach and in tandem, let's, let's lower those barriers. Um, the second employment related policy I'll discuss is the temporary assistance to needy families, which we call TANF, Family Violence Option Waiver. So TANF, as most of you probably know, is the federally funded cash assistance program for low-income families, which since 1996 has come with work requirements and many other stringent requirements. Sexual assault survivors who need financial assistance um, often are unable to work or meet these stringent requirements. So, under the TANF family violence option, um, states can waive certain requirements for victims of what they call family violence in order to prevent undue burdens and deter future violence. So under the FVO, states can waive time limits, work and residency requirements, child support cooperation agreements, and family cap provisions. Um, so importantly, Federal law defines a victim of family violence as one who has been battered or subject to extreme cruelty, and they don't specify the perpetrator's relationship to the victim. So that means implicitly um, non-IPV sexual violence survivors should qualify. Um, however, um, this is implemented by states. And at my last count, only 18 states include non-IPV survivors under their family violence option. So once again, expanding the family violence option to include non-IPV survivors would be a first step. Um, there are many other ways in which the FVO can be made friendlier to survivors of all kinds. Um, the process of screening TANF applicants for violence, for instance, has been shown to be quite flawed, and there are many hurdles survivors have to face, even in states where they are legally entitled to a waiver. So it's, a, it's an and, another and and. I want to see this expansion so that non-IPV sexual violence survivors are able to receive these waivers, and there's a great deal we can do to make this policy friendlier to survivors, especially given the very high rates of violence we know occur in people who use TANF. Um, so my recommendations for employment related policies are to expand unemployment insurance to cover non IPV sexual violence survivors in all states. Um, that federal guidelines should specify that the TANF family violence option eligibility does apply to non IPV survivors. Um, and to educate TANF recipients about their rights and caseworkers about the needs of sexual violence survivors. Now we will turn to policy gaps in terms of housing. As I noted um, in our previous session, sexual assault survivors often have difficulty paying for their housing expenses and may have to move. Yet the vast majority of state victim compensation programs um, don't allow those funds to be used for housing or relocation costs. I will say that more states cover relocation than general housing expenses. Um, additionally, Claire mentioned the Violence Against Women Act that it provides important housing protections for survivors living in fed federally subsidized housing such as the right to break a lease, the right to be protected against discrimination, et cetera. Yet in most states, um, state public housing and private housing, um, th these protections do not exist. So survivors can legally be penalized for breaking a lease, can be evicted for reasons related to violence. Um, as Claire mentioned, Massachusetts is one state that has passed its own state level law 
um, which is great to see, but we leave a lot up to states, um, as you can see through this whole policy discussion. So there's a lot of variance. Um, we touched on the importance of shelter last session. And as Claire noted at that time, although many states technically allow non-IPV sexual assault survivors to access domestic violence shelters, in practice, non-IPV survivors are often turned away from shelter due to a perceived lack of imminent danger. Um, and similarly, in public housing, the evaluation of safety and ongoing danger tends to use a strongly intimate partner violence lens. So it's difficult for non-IPV survivors to get priority status for public housing. Um, and then of course, importantly, there is a wholesale um, shortage of affordable housing. And so that compounds these existing effects. So the policy recommendations in this area are um, that all state victim compensation programs cover moving and housing expenses for sexual violence and IPV survivors to create VAWA style protections in state and private public housing in all states, to raise awareness of the housing safety needs of non-IPV survivors, especially among those who are working in shelters, um, transitional and affordable housing programs. Um, and of course, I think we'd all like to see an increase in the supply of shelter beds and subsidized and affordable housing. So my final policy area is looking at the economic services that are available for non-IPV survivors. Um, at present, most rape crisis centers in the country do not offer comprehensive, in-depth economic case management services. Um, and it's not for lack of will, it's because there is generally not enough funding or resources available to do so. Um, and similarly, most rape, cri rape crisis centers in the country don't offer direct financial assistance to survivors, again, due to those inadequate funding and resources. Um, and finally, um, many intimate partner violence focused providers exclude non-IPV survivors from their economic services, either by policy or just in practice. Um, so this leaves many survivors who have economic needs with nowhere to go. Um, so my recommendations follow, of course, from those gaps. Um, I think we'd probably all on this call like to see to boost access to economic case management services and financial stabilization funds at rape crisis centers. How can we do this? Um, I think this can be done by securing funding for demonstration programs. This might come from federal, state, or philanthropic sources um, to support model programs, put them in place. Um, and the critical companion step to this is to research the outcomes of these model programs to document best practices. And then finally, there's a need to fund case management services at rape crisis centers nationwide. The most direct path to this would, of course, be federal funding with a nationwide reach. But there may be a place, again, for state and philanthropic funding to get things moving at a local level and then scale up. So this is just a summary of the policy recommendations that I went over. This slide is really for your future reference. Um, as you're reviewing the slides, I won't go through all of these again. Um, and I'd like to just leave you with some final thoughts to close out this two-part series. Sexual violence has real economic impacts for survivors. Survivors' economic needs are inextricably entwined with their emotional safety and healing needs. Economic justice has a place in the sexual violence movement and in the heart of our service provision. Um, and finally, that policies and services are badly needed to address the economic needs of non-IPV survivors. Um, I also included references again for, for people's future use, but at this point we can turn it over to questions and discussion. Excellent, thank you. So I collected some questions as we were going along and um, let me ask uh, Jennifer, is it possible to 
give uh, an, uh, give a voice to Ann Neola, who is uh, one of the participants. A N N. Yep. And she, she can she can unmute herself. Yay. Okay. Great. All right. Let me move this chat over so I can see. Ann Neola is the director of the Victim Compensation Program um, for the state of Massachusetts. It has a much longer name than that. The Victim Compensation and Assistance Division, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And some of the questions are, were directed specifically to Ann. Um, so I collected some questions and I want to start with, I think this, I don't know if this question is for both of our presenters or not, but about is there an estimate of how much money it costs uh, on average for a survivor of sexual violence? And I don't know if that changes depending on if, you know, in the immediate aftermath or the long term or the lifelong. I don't, has there been a study that looks at that question? I'm sorry, was this, this is a question for Ann, right? I would say it's a, no, this is a question for um, the two presenters. Have we, has there, be, have there been studies on the amount of money that it actually on average would cost somebody who has experienced sexual assault? So a lot of those estimates um, I presented in our first session. So I would refer folks to the um, recording from June 14th. Um, the, these estimates are often quite flawed. They look at, they try to quantify in dollar terms costs um, and it might be costs immediately in the aftermath, but there's one study out of the CDC that attempted to quantify lifetime economic costs and, of rape specifically. And they quantified that at around um, $160,000. And as I noted on our last session, um, this is th these are minimum identifiable costs. So there are many, many costs that are not counted or not included mm -hmm. in that number. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many people who are not included because it was only about rape and not about other kinds of sexual violence. Thank you. Anne, I have some questions for you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, how quickly can people receive victim compensation if they are eligible to receive funds from victim comp? Oh, Anne, you're muted. Oh. I was muted by the host, but oh. <laughs> I'm unmuted. Um, when we speak about services and supports to survivors of sexual assault, we there's three categories. The first has been out, that's been to, um, stated here, are survivors who have um, kits and those expenses that are directly billed to the division in Massachusetts. And we've been doing that for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. There's the second category of individuals who have had a kit administered and then have needs that go beyond the kit. So they need counseling, they need um, lost wages, they need uh, replacement bedding and clothing. Um, so those are another category of survivors that we serve. The third are survivors who don't have kits administered. Mm -hmm. And in those circumstances, those are the situations where we do look to some sort of report to law enforcement. Now that could be you know, the more general police reports that we're all familiar with. It could be a report to campus police. It could be a report to DCF, it could be a report to EOEA or DPPC, as well as a restraining order or a stalking harassment order or criminal complaint. So we serve survivors across the board. Um, on the call with me today, are um, Ali Fiorello Kennedy and our new forensic claims coordinator, Ashley Marquez. So in the program, as I said, with the direct billing process, those claims come directly to us. Um, we see very few bills that go to survivors because the fact that we've been working directly through Ali, through 
um, now Ashley with contacts directly at hospitals. So we have direct contacts with the hospitals that provide these kits, whether they're SANE sites or not. Mm -hmm. And so we then can pay those expenses. And we took that on in order for the compensation for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to receive funding from VAWA, even though we had been helping survivors in the same capacities previously. So direct billing comes directly to us. We don't engage with the survivor specifically so that we can pay those expenses and help them move to whatever additional expenses they need. And in that case, we do require some sort of an application that we have. And again, in that case, we do not require a report to law enforcement. Again, if the survivor chooses to do that, that's their, their choice specifically. Um, it is not a requirement of the program. The only time that we require some sort of report is where the survivor doesn't have a kit administered. And in that case, we do look for some assistance. So in the direct billing process, we work directly with the hospital. We make the payments directly to the hospital. For those that have the needs afterwards, then we do work with um, them. Uh, and maybe Allie can pick it up from there just to clarify the process and the timing. Sure, thank you, Anne. Thanks, Anne. Um, so while we are working with hospitals in order to help um, survivors with their day of services, so the day of services related to the kits, um, the attachment B form is filled out by the hospital and that is sent with coupled with the expenses to our office. When we receive that, we then in turn go to EOPS, the Executive Office of Public Safety and Security, and request the 2A form, which is in many of you know the PSER form that documents that the kit was administered and a form of it was collected, toxicology or evidence. When a survivor is then following up with our office and sending us a shortened application, which will then open them up to the $25,000 for the post care, such as medicine, additional follow up doctor's appointments, um, therapy, lost wages. We go through the same process of going back to EOPS, we're requesting the 2A form and then being able to. Um, view that and see if we can make a application eligible. In all, um, if everything works correctly, this hopefully should uh, be wrapped up within two months so that we can start assisting survivors. But there's human error and that just occurs. Um, sometimes it's delayed with obtaining that 2A form. Sometimes we'll have to re-request it through EOPS or through hospitals. Um, and we will uh, follow up with that when we are needed. At times, we will reach back out directly to either the same coordinators for that region and ask for additional assistance. Sometimes we can ask for the hospital contacts to help with managing um, medical records and obtaining those records. So we definitely, we do build these contacts within the hospitals and um, are seeing regional coordinators um, to assist these survivors to the fullest. So and to that effect, if the claimant, if the survivor still owes funds to a provider, we will pay that provider directly on their behalf. If yes. it's something that they've paid out of pocket, we will, we will reimburse that. So um, in terms of direct billing, again, not sure how many other states are on this call, but 30 of the victim compensation programs that are administered out of the attorney general's offices follow a similar protocol. Um, to the other states, as Becca probably is more than well aware of that, um, there are other offices that are responsible for um, the payment of these expenses. So if you're working with a survivor that had um, the incident occur outside of Massachusetts, please let us know and we will make those direct connections for either you as the provider or case manager um, or for the individual that needs that assistance and support. So, um, and just to address expenses, I know that um, 
there's discussion about additional expenses that not only our program could offer, but others could offer. And given the pandemic this last year, many states are confronted by reduced court fees and fines, which has reduced their ability to consider either additional expenses or pay some expenses. And so I'm going to put a shameless plug in for anyone who would like to contact or can contact um, their um, de state delegation and ask them to support the VOCA fix bill. The VOCA fix bill would assist compensation programs, but even more so the VOCA assistance programs across the country, which can also provide assistance to survivors of sexual assault as well as to other crimes, but their capacity can, will be reduced over the next two years due to the depletion of the funds in the VOCA Act. Um, so it is, again, I'm sorry, but a shameless plug for your support in order for all of us to continue to provide services and supports to survivors of sexual assault. Mm -hmm. And is most of victim compensation, uh, the, the actual funds come from fines that, uh, or uh, some kind of expense that has been levied on the person who's committed the crime? So that differs from state to state. Mm -hmm. In Massachusetts, our funding streams are from the Office of Victims of Crime through an annual formula grant. Mm -hmm. So they provide roughly 60% of our funding. The remaining amount is provided through a state appropriation line to victim compensation, which this year our Attorney General strongly advocated for increased funding. And the exam one of the examples that she used is the significant needs of sexual assault survivors to access the funds needed either for kits or for post-exam expenses. Thank you. And I think at one point someone had asked what might be a standard amount that we see for the kits themselves. Was that a question? So that does range. Um, we see a minimum of maybe $2,000 to a max. It could be a, a few, you know, 30, you know, $30,000. It all depends on the variety of um, care provided um, during that course of treatment and how long their stay was within the ER. But roughly we are looking at expenses between 2000 and about 6000 for direct billing within itself, the day of treatment care. Mm -hmm. Post care could as much as anyone needs our assistance for. Mm -hmm. And whatever we pay in the direct billing um, expenses is not taken from the 25,000 that the survivor will ultimately have access to should they apply under the um, shorter application for post-exam ex expenses. So when they apply that way, they do have the full 25,000 Unless again, it's catastrophic, then it's fifty thousand. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me what is the average cost just for um, HIV prophylactic medication? Because I know that that has been an issue that some of our rape crisis centers have had to deal with, and it has to be given so quickly after the assault. Finding a place to get it um, is difficult. Yeah. So the expenses at least associated with what is administered as the hospital at the hospital is covered under the direct billing. And Ali, I don't know if you wanna pick it up from there. So it also depends on if a hospital sends a patient home and then suggests that they follow up with additional medicines post their care within the ER. Um, and if those medicines do come in after the exam and after they've been discharged home, would then come out of their 25,000 after the, for the short application. Um, for those medicines, along with the other, um, sometimes that are suggested such as anti-nausea, um, and it could be a, a wide variety of things that are being prescribed. Um, medicines could be about $2,000. If Thank not you. more, <laughs> depending. Yeah, I was going to say, and, mo and many times it's more. Um, because we look at this issue um, with the 
providers around the table when we first talked about direct billing. And there was the concern that if we included these post medications after the exam, that survivors would not be in a position to come back for infectious disease follow-up, which you know, it was strongly suggested from the medical community that that happened because in some cases, some survivors might not need all that medication or may need something different. Mm -hmm. So that was the, um, the, the medical advice that we looked at and considered under the discussions regarding our approach, this state's approach, Massachusetts approach to the prophylactic medications. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people from other states here on the call. And uh, would, I know that when we have provider meetings, when we pull our rape crisis folks together around the state, and we're a small enough state that we used to actually meet in person. We haven't done that for a while, but we would likely pull people together in person again in the future. We're, you know, we're, not, we're not a giant state, so we're able to do that. And we invite vict victim compensation staff to come to all of our meetings. And we had some, we have some very seasoned rape crisis folks here that have been working in the field for a long time. There has never been a time when they haven't had, they haven't taken up all of the time allocated to ask questions of victim compensation. So I would throw out to other states, if you haven't done it, to bring your victim comp folks in um, as you can, you know, as Claire talked about and Becca talked about, it was, it's a very, very clear connection between victim compensation and the sexual violence programs um, in that, that partnership really it is very valuable in um, literally very valuable and as well as emotionally very valuable to providers. And we thank you for that. And I will just add that if anyone here on this call is having issues directing or connecting with other than another state's compensation program, please reach out to us. We will help make those connections um, we especially have made some very strong bonds within the New England, New York, and Pennsylvania areas um, to help survivors um, because of the timelines and the needs to respond as quickly um, as possible. And um, also, thank you all specifically, obviously, to Bark and Claire and the case managers there who are always supportive to survivors and supportive to us to help make these connections and provide the supports and services that we need, but to also to all the rape crisis centers who are staffed with very dedicated personnel who are always willing to make, to take that extra step to make a connection, not just to victim comp, but to other programs. And I think as Claire and Becca have um, noted, you know, we don't do this work alone. The only way we can do the best to help a survivor is to do this in a collaborative fashion. So obviously we've had some great co collaborations in the past, but we look forward to any future collaborations that may come out of this discussion. So thank you for giving us some time. Um, I just wanted to point out that there's a, some additional information in the chat that Jane Doe Inc. folks provided and we'll capture that to make sure that that goes out to you as well. Uh, so I had, uh, there was a question that came up, how much does a landlord need to know about why a lease is being broken? So if, uh, does the landlord need to know that a sexual assault took place? What does the landlord require? Um, what does somebody require to disclose? I can answer that based on my practical experience and if, um... Somebody like uh, Victim Rights Law Center is on that call. Uh, if there is something else that they would do, I'd appreciate them stepping in. But from our practical experience is that whenever we write a letter as a, um, a third party qualified um, advocate, we only include in that letter to the landlord that the survivor experienced sexual violence in this particular unit. So we include the address we are not required to include the landlords, uh, sorry, the perpetrator's names. Um, but as long as we include the incident and where it happened, uh, sometimes it's not even that the incident happened in this particular landlord's unit. 
For instance, if uh, the incident happened um, in a different place, but the perpetrator knows where the survivor lives. So, and therefore the survivor needs to leave this place because of those safety concerns. We uh, personalized the letter based on that particular survivor's safety needs. And um, that's the most that we need to include. Uh, we, we definitely have to include that there was a sexual assault incident because that is part of the crimes that is covered under these protections. Thank you. And we had also, we'll capture this um, Hema from uh, Jane Doe Inc, who used to work with the Victim Rights Law Center. Again, awesome that that, is, uh, that connection is being made, has given a response in the chat and we will capture that as well. We have about uh, one minute left and Amy wants to uh, finish up here. Amy, do you wanna jump in and explain the ending? I think um, we are going to just wrap up and thank everybody for joining us today. Um, and if you have a moment, and we would love to hear your feedback about this program in the chat, um, or I'm going to put in the chat just uh, how you might be able to be touch base with Janice and I for future programming, because we're hoping to continue um, this series as we move forward and would love to hear what you'd like to learn more about and um, what you appreciated about today's training. And again, I wanna thank all of you for joining us and for uh, Becca and Claire's really informative and insightful uh, presentation. And thank you too, to the Victims Comp folks for being with us as well. So I hope you all have a great day today. And if you have a minute um, to just put in the chat what you particularly appreciated about this, we would very much welcome that or any other feedback you have. Thank you.